Hi guys, Ben here and welcome to Motivation to Invest. Howard Marks is one of the greatest investors of all time. As founder of Oak Tree Capital, which manages over $120 billion. He has beat the market multiple times and is a strong advocate of market cycles. He believes everything is governed by cycles, the economy, the stock market, and even life in general. He has predicted many of the previous stock market crashes and his iconic memos are read by the likes of legendary investors such as Warren Buffett. In a previous interview, he stated, we cannot predict what will happen tomorrow, but by knowing where we are in the market cycle can help us to predict the probability of future outcomes. His whole investment strategy is being a contrarian investor, which is observing the masses and doing the opposite. So in this video, I've compiled together informative clips from interviews in 2019 and late 2018 where he effectively predicts the 2020 stock market crash. He also includes investment tips on how you can best take advantage of these opportunities. Let's dive in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, coming in, yeah, flex, I just want to win. Welcome back to Motivation to Invest. Before we get started, go ahead, smash that like button for the YouTube algorithm. That allows us to continue providing you with free valuable content like this. I post videos every week on stock market investing tips and strategies. In addition, I post stock pick videos on stocks that I personally have invested in myself. So if that's something that you want to keep updated on, be sure to hit that subscribe button and make sure the notification bell is turned on. That way you'll get updated when these future stock picks are at tremendous prices. Now let's get into the video. If I look at the summary of the books, you are making a strong point that history may not repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. And the biggest truism of capital markets is that they follow a cycle of boom and bust. So according to your assessment, where are we on the cycle? Well, I think that um, it, we're certainly not below the midpoint. I think we're above the midpoint. I think that we've, we've, we're in the middle of an economic and market recovery, which has gone on for a long time and to great length. Um, there's, uh, you know, until the last few days, there's a lot of optimism around, a lot of risk tolerance, and a lot of money trying to make its way into, uh, into investments. And if you put all that together, I think it's clear that uh, that we're in the later innings when the economy's d been doing well as it has, the companies have been doing well as they have, the psychology is positive as it has been, um, the stock prices have been rising, getting everybody very excited, and the prices are high by most objective measures, that is the time when you shouldn't worry that much about missing opportunity and you should worry more about losing money and when we're high in the cycle it's time to be defensive in my opinion so it's a relative thing it's a rolling adjustment that you should make it, obviously the higher the market goes in its cycle the higher prices go i would think the less you would want to have invested but that's just me at oak tree we think and 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 one of one of my mottos is we never know where we're going, but we sure as hell ought to know where we are. What's going on around us? What does that imply about the future? And um, if we conclude that the present developments justify a more defensive position, then there's no time like the present. So we start and we do what we can, and hopefully we do enough before the stuff hits the fan. And you talked about, you know, sort of the pain associated with going to cash. And then if you mm. engage in abstention and the market keeps going mm. up, then obviously you underperform. And, and let's point out the most important, one of the most important adages in investing that being too far ahead of your time is indistinguishable from being wrong. Absolutely. Early is wrong. The, the particulars vary. The speed of the movement, the, the amplitude of the movement, the duration of the cycle, the immediate causes, the immediate effects are different. And everybody says to me nowadays, which cycle is this like? And the answer is that this cycle has similarities to some of the past ones I've seen and is totally different in other ways, as you indicate, be, 
involving interest rates and it, also the Fed actions are unprecedented. So there are differences from each cycle to all the others, but there are some common threads. And, and uh, 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 I love that quote, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. There are themes that rhyme from cycle to cycle. And when I think back over my 50 years, and I've lived through half a dozen substantial cycles, what are the common threads? And in the booms or, or yeah, booms that I've seen, there have been common threads, primarily too much optimism, too little risk aversion, too much money in the hands of people who are too eager to put it to work. Now, if you think about it, that's a pretty good recipe for a boom. And if you think further, it would be hard to imagine having a boom with those ingredients missing. So I think we can state that we want to be on the watch out for high optimism, low risk aversion, a lot of money and eagerness to put it to work. I believe that we always will have cycles. The interesting thing, if you, if you pay attention, is that when things have gone very well for a long time, people start to say, well, maybe we won't have any more cycles. Maybe it's gonna go straight up forever. And of course, that is the exact time when the probability of a decline is the greatest. We're seeing that now. We are more cautious than usual today. You're right about that. Because we think the market is elevated in its cycle. And because we think there has been optimism, risk tolerance, and, uh, and uh, money eager to get to work. Mr. Marx, to your mind, what perhaps could crush this market? Will it be Fed? Will it be oil? Or something which we don't know, it could potentially pop up after some time? Well, uh, let me just say that I particularly like the fact that your list includes that last one. And I made my own list uh, in one of my memos back around 03, 04, I talked about the things that could hurt the market at that time. I talked about $100 oil. I talked about a falling dollar. I talked about a few things. And then the last thing on my list, like yours, I said, or something else. Because we should never deceive ourselves into thinking that we have anticipated all the issues and that we know what's going on. The market thinks about certain ones. It anticipates those. It may reflect those in prices. The market really has, uh, the, is at the, always at the risk of being knocked for a loop by something that nobody has anticipated. At the significance of the number 10, 10 years since the Lehman bankruptcy, 10 years uh, since low interest rates, etc. What happens in the 11th year? I know that you don't know, but I'd still want you to give us some sense of, you know, just the timeline to the cycle and what happens in the 11th year. From a, from a stance perspective, you're cautious right now, would you be more cautious? How do you see things unfolding in well, 2019? What most people do is that when things go well for a long time, they get more excited. Generally speaking, what I do is that when things have gone well for a long time, I get more cautious. As you've said, Tanvir, we're in the 10th year of an economic recovery. There has never been a recovery in the U.S. that went more than 10 years. We are in the 10th year of a bull market in, the, in, in stocks. By some measures, we are in the longest bull market in history. So the point of the book is that where we are shifts the odds. And when you're in the 10th year and 10th years historically is a long time, you can't say, well, we're likely to go another 10 years. The odds of it extending decline. The subtitle of the book really holds the key, getting the odds on your side. I don't know what's going to happen in the 11th year, but I do know that based on history, based on norms, we are less likely to have a strong economy than usual.
old saying on Wall Street that bull markets don't die of age, but when they end, they end badly. So whenever this market cycle will end, do you think the end game could be bad? And what do you think could happen? Because in 2008, money rushed back into US dollar. A US Treasury received bulk of the inflows from emerging markets. So whenever the cycle would end, what do you think the shape of the world could look like? Well, there you go again, as Ronald Reagan said, trying to get me to make a forecast. Um, <laughs> but I commend your perseverance. Um, look, I don't, I don't describe what we're having now as a bubble. People have gotten used to the concept of bubble and crash, bubble and crash. It happens that if you live through the last 20 years, the last two cyclical episodes were bubble and crash. We had the internet tech bubble, which crashed. We had the subprime mortgage bubble, which crashed. That doesn't mean that every upswing becomes a bubble, which is an extreme upswing, and crashes. And I don't think that this upswing has been as dramatic as those two. And I don't think the correction has to be as dramatic as those two. That doesn't mean it's going to be fun. Because in those two, I'm going to, roughly speaking, say stocks went down 50 odd percent. Maybe in the next one, they'll only go down 30 percent. Doesn't mean it's going to be fun. Uh, but I don't think that we are as levered as a society today. I don't think our essential financial institutions are as levered. I don't think that we have anything in the mix, which is as, shall I say, fraudulent as subprime mortgages, the central banks and the Fed turned their attention to stimulating the economy and they engaged in massive rate cutting and interest rates went to zero, negative in some places. And we had massive stimulation in the form of quantitative easing, which meant the central banks buying securities which has the effect of number one, raising their price and reassuring people about risk, and number two, putting money in circulation. Because when the central bank buys securities, it pays for them with money, and that money, uh, when it circulates in the economy, lifts the economy. So in the last 10 years, we've had an unusual emphasis on stimulation of the economy, but that it brings risks as well uh, because it brings the risk of the economy overheating and thus of hyperinflation. It's a complex, uh, what I say is we never know where we're going, but we sure as heck ought to know where we are. And that's why the essence of the book is to predicate your investment decision on an understanding of where we stand in the cycle today. It is possible, not easy, possible to know where we stand in the cycle today. It is not possible to know what's gonna to happen tomorrow. Having said that, where we stand in the cycle determines the probability distribution of the returns that, that investors face in the cycle. They should know where that, what that probability distribution looks like, when it is in their favor, and when it is against them. And that really is the greatest theme of the book. Investment performance in particular, for me, is like a bowl full of lottery tickets. You never know which ticket's gonna be chosen. Sometimes the bowl has 70% winning tickets and 30% losing tickets. Sometimes it has 70% losing tickets and 30% winning tickets. Wouldn't it be nice to know the difference? I think it's possible. But you want it, when, when it's 70% winners and 30% losers, you wanna go all in. You want to invest heavily in aggressive securities. And you reach into the bowl, or maybe the gods of fate reach into the bowl, and they pull out a ticket, and it's a loser. So, you know, uh, as, as my best friend uh, Bruce Newberg says out in California, when we play backgammon, which is a game that is dominated by dice, there are probabilities and outcomes. We can get the probabilities on our side. That does not ensure a favorable outcome but it's, it's the only thing we can try to do so. And if you enjoyed this video, go ahead, smash that like button, and definitely subscribe. See you next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, coming in.
Yeah, flex, I just wanna win. Yeah, LA BB, who we running with? Yeah, 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 yeah. Coming in, yeah, flex, I just wanna win. Yeah. 